Um, it may feel today like I am speaking primarily to folks who don't know the Lord, but I want to challenge Christians today to really evaluate their faith. Now, I don't know what your eschatology is like. Now, that is a big fancy word for what you think the end is going to be like when Jesus returns. I used to have lots of solid opinions on what I thought it was going to be like. I kind of had, a, had it all figured out when Jesus would return and how and when the rapture would take place and how the whole story would close. And then I found that the more I studied it and the more I started listening to good teachers, the less I was confident and sure about what was going on. And uh, you can get really confused real quick. And then, you know, to top it off, I'll be very transparent with you. I also used to think it didn't really matter anyway because, um, you know, I didn't really think the end was any closer now than it was when the apostles were around. And they talked about Jesus coming soon, so who really knows how long soon is, right? Today, however, I am more convinced than ever that we just might be seeing the end of things uh, kind of creeping up on us. Um, I, I don't know if you, you know, I mean, obviously we're all thinking about COVID and what's going on with that for the last year. But, you know, the, the Bible talks about, about uh, pestilences and famines and plagues and all kinds of things. Have, have any of you... Googled or seen the, the, the whole mouse plague thing that's going on in Australia right now? Now, if you haven't seen that, prepare to be totally disgusted and go, and go Google it. I mean, they have got fields, farmers' fields, the whole field is just moving with mice. It's just like, it just, ugh, it's just like they say the smell is so bad in some places that you pretty much have to wear a gas mask to get out there and, and just, just to even be outside because the smell of these mice is so bad. There's just millions upon millions upon millions of mice that are overrunning whole areas of Australia. Google it. You'll, you'll be amazed. Um, you know, then there's all the whole thing of wars and rumors of wars that Jesus talked about. I don't know if you follow the news, but in the last couple of weeks, Israel had an election, and they brought in a guy who is ultra-right-wing, ultra-nationalist, who is, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say the chances are he's a little trigger-happy and willing to just kind of uh, engage in any fight somebody else wants to start. And then, this last week, Iran uh, votes in a new president, and some of you are old enough to remember back in the 90s uh, when there was huge persecution in Iran of, of sort of non-Muslims and, and non-Iranian uh, you know, non uh, folks. There was a guy that had the, the title of the Butcher of Tehran for his, his uh, meanness and his atrocities. Well, he is now the president of Iran. So you start to see things shaping up and you start thinking, hmm... Well, that's, you know, that's really, really interesting. Now, uh, you know, the thing that's key about that is that Jesus told us when you see these things beginning, don't, don't wait to see them in full blower. Wait, wait, don't, you know, don't sort of think, well, this is just the beginning, I got time. Jesus said, when you see these things beginning, watch and stay alert so that the end does not catch you unprepared. Now, I don't really want to talk about my particular version of eschatology today, though. But it's entirely possible, I think, that we are near the end. And so given that, I just want to ask a simple question. And that is, what's the definition of eternal life? So somebody kind of shout something out at me. What's the definition of eternal life? Life forever. Okay, somebody else? Only one brave person here? Come on. So what, what do you think eternal life means? Never ending. What else? It's not a trick question. Eternally in his presence. Yeah. Now, did you know that Jesus himself gave a definition? And we're going to probably just put this verse up on the screen. In John chapter 17, verse 3, here's what Jesus says. He says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life is knowing God. Now, all the other definitions are correct. We live forever, we don't die, we live in God's presence. Those are all true statements. But eternal life is more than just living forever. Eternal life is knowing God. So what does knowing God mean? And that's kind of what I want to focus on today. So look at this verse with me in Matthew chapter 7, 
verses 21 to 23. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many wonders in your name? And I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And then from there, and we're not going to put it up on the screen, but the, the, the very next thing Jesus talks about is the parable of the two houses, the house built on the rock and the house built on the sand. And, you know, the point of that parable is that you've got two houses, and from the outside, you really can't tell the difference. They both look good. They both protect you from the sun in the daytime, and they protect you from the cold at night. Everything looks great until the pressure comes, until the storm hits it. And then the one that doesn't have a foundation collapses. And the point of it all, Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 26, is that if you hear but you don't do, then you're one who doesn't really have a relationship with God. You don't really know him. Now, that's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Because you can be a person who looks on the outside like you're all spiritual and doing great. You're prophesying, casting out demons, even performing miracles. And, you know, you might say, well, how is that possible if your life isn't right with God? Well, because there's power in the name of Jesus. That's why. God's going to honor his name. But you can be doing all those things, but internally not really have a relationship with God, or your relationship with God is kind of a mess. Now look at this verse in Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. This is interesting. It says, the Lord brings a charge against his people. Now just pause there. That word charge is the same, or an accusation. That, That word is the same thing as when the police charge someone with a crime or something like that, okay? That's what it is. And God is charging his people, and he says, there's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Now, the question here is, who's God accusing? Well, his people, right? There's there's no knowledge of God in the land. This isn't an accusation against people who don't claim to have a relationship with God. This is specifically focused on the ones that God calls his people. And then look what he says about them five verses later in Hosea 4, 6. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And he says, because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. No knowledge, no eternal life. And so the, the theme that if you're, if you're jotting things down today is eternal life is knowing God. When we don't know God, we're living in a precarious spot. You know, you can be in church every Sunday. Watch it online very faithfully when you didn't get your registration in on time. And thank God that's all going to be over by next week. I won't miss that. You can give in the offering You can volunteer as an usher or a greeter. You can be on the worship team. You can do all kinds of things. But if you don't know God, if you don't know him personally, and if you don't have a relationship with him, then you're in a precarious spot. Now, what about the positive side of this? What do we contrast it with in terms of what happens when we do know God? Look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 says this, the people who know their God will be strong and carry out great exploits. Now, that's an old word, but here's what the word exploits means. A bold and daring feat, an achievement requiring courage and strength. The people who know their God are going to be bold and daring and do things that require courage and strength. When we do know God, that's, that, that's a pretty solid promise. Now, I don't want to be fuzzy about this. This isn't talking about knowing about God. This is talking about knowing Him. You can know about God. You can know about the Bible. You can know about all kinds of theological topics and ideas, and you can even know big theological words like eschatology. But that's not the same as knowing God. So do you know God? How can you tell? You know, a friend of mine, 
uh, once said it this way. He said, my prayer to God always is, God, shock me now, don't shock me later. You know, shock me now. Deal with what you got to deal with now, because I don't want to be standing in front of you and say, Lord, Lord, and you say, I never knew you. God, shock me now, don't shock me later. Now, do you know there's a test in the Bible, a test that gives us a pretty clear indication of whether we know God or not. It's in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, and it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on the screen in one of my favorite translations of the Bible. It's called the Complete Jewish Bible, and uh, it, it just happens to be one of my favorites. And here's, here's the way it's written here. It says, the way we can be sure we know him is if we are obeying his commands. That's how we can be sure we know God, is if we're obeying his commands. Anyone who says, I know him, but isn't obeying his commands is a liar or is deceived, and the truth is not in him. But if someone keeps doing what God says, then truly love for God has been brought to its goal in him. It's interesting. One house is built on the rock. It's built on a foundation of knowing God, having that personal relationship with God. The other one, is built on a foundation of simply knowing about God. One stands the pressures that are building against Christians, and one doesn't. And I don't know if you've noticed, but it's becoming less and less acceptable to be a Christian today. I don't know how many else, you know, am I the only guy who feels that? I mean, I I think it's becoming less and less and less acceptable all the time. You know, there's this whole idea that we have this idea of right and wrong. And we we define right and wrong based on an absolute standard that's in God's Word. But the world says, well, that's kind of an old-fashioned idea. Right and wrong should be based on not offending each other, not not being judgmental towards each other. So if you think it's wrong and I think it's right, well, then you're wrong because you think it's wrong. And I'm right because I think it's right. And it doesn't matter what it is. If we disagree, it's just kind of like it's weird. And as Christians, we hold to this absolute standard that says we have these things that we believe are right and these things that we believe are wrong. We have things that we're obliged to do and things that we're obliged to not do. And the rest of the world says, we don't like that. We'd far rather just move the goalpost every time we want to we, we change how, how things work. It's becoming less and less acceptable to be a Christian. You know, it's very interesting. We were talking to our daughter in Thailand this week and, uh, you know, this whole horrible stories of, of all these graves that they're finding. Um, you know, it's very interesting how that gets spun against Christians. You know, it, it, she was saying that in Thailand, the news headlines say, in Canada, nuns murdered hundreds of children. Or did it say thousands? A thousand. thousand. A thousand children. Nuns murdered a thousand children. It's, it, 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 you know, I mean, it's like, that's not what happened. And yet, you can imagine that as news shifts like that, you know, when's the last time you saw anything in the news that was positive about being a Christian? It's been a long time. One house will stand, one house won't. Now, how's your house built? Is your house built on sand? Or is your house built on that firm foundation? Do you really know God? Do you really know Him? Or do you just know about Him? Does your knowing change your life? Does the, does the knowing change who you are? You know, when things go sideways on you and the pressures of life start to build and things start to, to come in, do you question whether God cares or do you find it easy to trust? Now, you know what? I want to say this. I think we all question sometimes whether or not God cares. I think that we've all sort of looked up at God and said, like, hello, where are you right now? I'm not talking about that questioning. I'm talking about does your faith stand or does it not? Do you trust God or do you not? Are you able to say, God, I don't get it, I don't understand it, but I trust you and I know you understand it, and I can be at peace with that? When trouble comes, do you know him 
or do you just know about him? Because remember, the ones that know him will be strong and carry out great exploits. Does knowing him mean that you want to be like him? Does knowing God mean that you want to find out what he's like, find out what he does, find out what he loves, and then line your life up with that? Now, I'm going to be here again next week. Beth and Dustin are taking a little bit of a, of a break before they really sort of see everything uh, get, get going here as we start heading through the later part of the summer. And I'm going to talk next week about how you can know when it's God speaking to you. When you're, when you're sensing something, when you're hearing something, when you feel like, you know, I, I feel like God wants me to do something, how can you be relatively certain that it's God speaking to you and not something else? We're going to talk about that next week. But today I want to leave you with this one thought, and that is eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is knowing God. You know, we're not Christians because being a Christian is easier than everything else. How many know that's true? We're not Christians because it just makes our lives so much less complicated. We're Christians because we know our God. We know Him. You know, the, it, it's a lifelong pursuit. We never fully know God. I, I think that's one of the things that will happen in eternity is that we'll spend all of eternity learning to know God more deeply. And because he's infinite, it will take an infinite amount of time. And I think for, for all of the rest of eternity, we'll discover new things about God and be amazed by him. Even the Apostle Paul, who wrote almost a third of the New Testament, said near the end of his life in his letter to the Philippians, he says, I've given everything I've got so that I can know him and I still want to know him more so that I can attain eternal life. Eternal life is not just living forever. Eternal life isn't just a promise that we'll be in heaven when we die. Eternal life is knowing God. And people who know their God will be strong and carry out great exploits. Amen? Amen. You know, you might be here this morning, you might be watching online, and you've never given your heart to Jesus. Maybe you don't really even know God at all. And you might like to be introduced today. And I want to give you an opportunity to meet God today, to begin knowing Him. And so in just a minute... I'm going, to pray, I'm going to pray a simple prayer, which we're going to put on the screen, and hopefully it'll go on the live stream as well. And it's a prayer that just invites God to come into relationship with you. And it's the beginning of that journey toward knowing Him. If you've never prayed a simple prayer like this, I'm just going to invite you to pray it with me. Um, and we're, we're, not, you know, we're, we're just all going to pray it together. I'm going to ask everyone to just repeat it after me. And uh, if, you're, if you're at home, you're watching online, or you're, you've, you've, you're, you're watching through some other place, um, I just want to invite you as well to consider praying this prayer with us and allowing God to begin that relationship with you. The prayer just goes like this. Heavenly Father, this morning I want to give my heart to you. I want to choose to live my life your way. I want to ask you today to come into my life to forgive me for the wrong things I've done and to help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, would you just do one thing for me? Come and talk to me when we dismiss or you can talk to my wife. Uh, Veronica, um, just let us know. Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you today. I'd like to encourage you. I'd like to congratulate you. And if you're watching online, you can drop the church an email and uh, just let them know 
I prayed that prayer with the pastor on Sunday, and someone will reach out to you to encourage you and to, to bless you. Now, you know, as we bring it to a close this morning, I know it's, it's been kind of, you know, not as long as usual. It's, it's a little short, but you know, that's the deal that God put on my heart is eternal life is knowing God. And I just really felt like I want to challenge you as I was challenged. Look at my life, look at my heart, look at my situation and ask the question, do I really know God? Is my life lined up with that? You know, one last thing, and that is, just as a closing idea, you know, look around you. There's lots of extra seats. Next week, the masks are hopefully coming off. We can go back to having a lot of folks here. Take a look around, figure out who's not here. Give them a phone call this week and say, hey, listen, or send them a text message or however you communicate. Hey, listen, we've been missing you. Church is back to normal come next week. And let's, let's watch God begin to touch people's lives. Amen.